Well, I'm here with Dr. Michael Taylor, and I'll tell you what, we are, I think, birds of a feather uh, in so many ways, and she can talk about that in a moment. Uh, among other things, she is a reading recovery teacher leader, and she has a grandchild that she's going to talk to us about. So I'm going to turn things over to her by saying, could you first of all give us a little bit of background of your education and background in, in all this? And then what uh, attracted me to talk to you was uh, the experiences you were posting on uh, social media about your grandson and, and what's happening. And I think uh, it's almost a microcosm of, of what's happening uh, in the big picture. So uh, I, we'd just like to hear all about that and ideas you have around that. So that all said, I'm going to stop uh, talking and let you take over. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sam. Um, I want to say that I uh, know my old friend, Dr. Uh, P. David Pearson was on with you last week and David was in Michigan uh, just when I first came to Michigan in 1994. And uh, we have been great colleagues and friends and he made the comment to someone they said, have you met Michael Taylor? And he said, everywhere I go in Ingham County, Michael Taylor's just been. <laughs> so um, I was thrilled to see him. Uh, I'm, I'm walking in big shoes behind him. Um, I came from New Zealand um, 29 years ago. I was, am a reading recovery teacher leader, and I was recruited to implement a site for the Ingham ISD, the Ingham, a service agency. And I was there for 15 uh, for 15. 15 years, yes, and then I uh, moved on as a teacher leader into a, a couple of other reading recovery sites, of which I'm still a, a reading recovery teacher leader for one, and I have been an independent literacy consultant, and I know you're going to put the link to my drmichaeltaylor.com in the chat so that people can look me up. Um, so I have been a classroom teacher. Sam and I really are birds of a feather because we have both been reading, uh, been teachers for 52. In fact, Sam tells me he's just clocked over to 53 years. So I got this white hair very legitimately around the corners of those tables and the corridors of schools. Okay. Uh, well, now let's get into um, the issues you were posting about with your grandson and uh, keeping in mind that a lot of my uh, followers are teachers themselves. So any teaching tips you can throw in along the way are, are more than welcome. So uh, we'll send it back to you. Okay, so I want to preface, I want to contextualize what I'm experiencing with my grandson, who is seven. I have more than one grandchild, but this particular one I've been working with, um, in the fact that listening, speaking, reading, writing, viewing, presenting are all language processing language-based processes and that they're all about communicating if we're reading we're receiving somebody else's message if we're writing then we're giving someone our message so when we talk about reading and writing to me we cannot take the language out of it so here I have the seven-year-old little bright-eyed bushy-eyed tail um, grandson great physical intuition he's been driving uh, four wheelers and golf carts and cars and skateboards since he was tiny. He really, he can back them up. He can tell you all about them. He knows all about them. So he goes off to school. He has, and I know I'm his granny, but this is true. He's been tested for speech. He has wonderful oral language, wonderful knowledge of the world. So here's this little boy going off to school pretty well prepared for school he wasn't he's never been that interested in he, he can read books to him but when he gets to school the assessment that he is faced with is uh, about sounds and letters and that is really 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 hard for this little boy um, and a year later we've had him assessed he is ADHD but he has uh, uh, processing speed and working memory very, very difficult for him. So here he is at school and he his whole reading cur curriculum is about learning letters and sounds in isolation. Now, this is a boy who 
has the gestalt of life. He wants to know why he's doing things and why should he put that much effort into doing things. When it's just hissing and spitting out these sounds and letters, he's not interested in them. He doesn't need them when he's doing his, you know, outside work. He's just fine. So a year after he started school, he, uh, six months after into kindergarten, he was assessed for intervention. And he was assessed um, on the, the, the Dibble's nonsense word, and he failed miserably because that was hard for him. Um, and so he goes into intervention, and he has intervention with an intervention that I think is actually a pretty good intervention. But he has it for one year, and he has really made no progress whatsoever. Now... I was watching all this happening. I'm reading to him. I'm encouraging him. I'm trying not to interfere. Um, but here is this little boy who hates reading. So you can imagine how that broke my heart. Absolutely broke my heart. And so um, I became officially involved in as an official advocate for him with my daughter and son-in-law. And I went along to school and I, and, and I, I said, if this boy had had strep throat and he had gone to the pediatrician for one year and only be given amoxicillin and it hadn't fixed his strep throat, we would say that was medical malpractice. And as far as I'm concerned, when we do this to little children, we only give them one way in, one size fits all, then this is instructional malpractice. And uh, Mari wrote back in 1987, learning to be learning disabled. And I'm sit sitting watching this unfold in front of my eyes. So I became involved in the IEP, uh, not, not IEP, so he was, he's not in special ed, but in his um, student team meetings. And I became his official um, interventionist. And I work with him every day after school, 3.34, depending when I get, if I'm working when I get home. Now that little boy in that time, he's now he's now in grade two. He's a two and a quarter years into schooling and I have him reading kind of mid towards the end of grade one. But we had the most wonderful breakthrough over the weekend. This is a little boy who will avoid reading. He only does it because he loves me and he knows he needs to do it. Twice, Friday and Saturday, I was over at his house and I said, you need to get a book to read to me. We weren't having a lesson. He bought the, the book with no pictures to read to me. I said to him, have you read this book? Did somebody read this book? He said, no, I tried to read it to myself last night, but it was too hard. So I said, well, we'll work it out now. And do you know, apart from preposterous, and ridiculous and a couple of the other funny words in that story he read that book beautifully he decoded tricky words he broke them apart he needs a little help and then he's away and he's done but because this little boy has great language he has great vocabulary i talk to parents all the time about my analogy is the three-legged stool and what happens if you cut a leg off a three-legged stool? It's going to fall over. And those three legs of the stool are the three sources of input. Yes, we absolutely need the visual information that includes, excuse me, the sounds, because we're not an oral code. Things are written down. So we absolutely need to be able to process the print. But in behind that, the other two legs of the school stool are things that he has strengthened, that he has not been allowed to use in the reading curriculum in his school. He has been at school for two and a quarter years and he has yet to bring home an instructional reading book that he can read that has, makes any sense, that has, he is not interested in them. And that brings me to another absolute pet thing of mine is the joy of reading. We don't do things that aren't joyous. You've got to have that motivation. You've got to have that buy-in. And you've got to have the amygdala in the brain fired up with that glucose to want to do it. He came to me on Saturday with the book with no pictures. And he really, really wanted to read that book. And he did. And that's, we're not finished yet. We've got work to do.
Sure, he needs to know about vowel teams and blends and inflectional endings. And we're doing that in the course of reading and writing real books. Uh, let's see. Uh, my, I just clicked a wrong button. Give me a second here. <laughs> there we are. Okay. Uh, oh, beautifully put in a beautiful story. Uh, a, a couple of thoughts here. Uh, first of all, uh, some of my readers are not familiar with what some people call the queuing systems. I like the way you describe them instead. Uh, and they are definitely not aware that visual, many, 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 many of them are not aware that visual means the sound symbol relations. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, that, that's, I, I so uh, appreciate uh, Marie Clay and her work, but I so wish <laughs> she had not used visual as the way of saying that, uh, because it, it, even when I, when I was teaching courses, I had to point out, oh no, this is the sound symbol relations. It's not the pictures in the book. It's the sound symbol relations. And my own little thinking on what you've just said is that it sounds like what might have very well happened with your grandson is that he was getting all this information about visual and how to, and visual information, but no, uh, what P. David Pearson would call uh, gradual release of responsibility uh, and uh, apply, in applying all of this. And what you've done masterfully is, is cause that to happen. And the other point I think you're making is uh, the, the joy of language experience. And we both are fans of that. Uh, and, and I certainly wouldn't mind you giving us a little uh, tutorial about that as well, because uh, that's the kind of thing that any teacher can take away uh, and make use of. So uh, having said all that, uh, your reactions. <laughs> well, a bit language experience, of course, goes way, way back to Sylvia Ashton Warner and Brian Camborn. And um, I'm blanking on the one I know so well, Brown Book. Anyway, you'll think of his name. Essentially, using the experiences of the child. You know, I say to adults, I work with teachers all the time, and I say to them, Okay, put your hand up when you last read a boring book. Now, you can't use college books, but for recreational reading, put your hand up when you last read a boring book. And of course, nobody puts their hand up because as adults, we don't tend to do boring things. We tend to find ways to make them more interesting if it's a little bit repetitive, but basically, it's really hard to keep doing boring stuff. So um, when I think about language experience, I one of my ways in with my grandson at the beginning indeed was we I wrote lots of he wrote every day he's wrote lots of stories he's got three books full of the stories he wrote and he's very proud of that we can look back and say, oh look how you made those ends when you started look how you worked this out in fact we have a family um, Halloween party which is next Saturday night and I'm in charge of the food because I like to feed people I, I, of the menu I, I delegate however Last year, Max and I made the menu, and he wrote as part of his writing, one, two, three, and we had all the things, took a picture of it, gave it to mummy, and said, mummy, dish these out to people to make, and so last week, I said, Max, we better get on to our menu, and we've got some different things this year. That is language experience. That is writing from your own heart, writing from something that means something to you, and of course, when you do that, you have to use sounds and letters and words in order to record it. And sometimes people call, you know, when we have the letter sounds and then we have the meaning and the structure, there's a compensatory times of, types of inputs. For Max, he wasn't able to use hit the compensatory pieces that would help him not guess. I never never seen a child guess in 52 years of teaching they you it's it's never just a nonsense word thrown in there the kid put it in there as a placeholder of meaning for some reason whatever it is we don't always know however he we wrote the menus we also they have a dog we have a dog they play so we wrote lots of stories about the dog and the dogs fighting over the bone and uh, we wrote about max can sit on my knee in our gator and he now can work the clutch and the accelerator because my husband and I firmly believe everybody needs to know how to work a stick shift. 
I'm still changing the gear lever at the moment, but he is synchronizing the clutch and the accelerator. And for me, this is good for his brain because that's exactly what he's having trouble with when he's reading is synchronizing all of these inputs. So it doesn't matter how you're practicing it, but you do need to practice it with print. But he, um, you know, language experience coming from the heart of what I, when I'm talking to a child and we're going to be writing something, I watch for that flash in their eyes when their eyes light up and it's like, oh, did you know something? So um, language experience gets those early words in, all that hearing and recording sounds, cat concepts about print, um, a, a newer version of that, Sam, and I've, I've worked with this recently in a district where I've seen incredible results, is interactive writing. I am seeing kindergartners come into grade one so much more aware of how print works from doing these sorts of writing. I'm a big believer in writing. Okay, and, and since you are also a recovery trainer, uh, and you know, well, and I can remember a my teacher, days. I'm a teacher leader, a reading teacher recovery leader. I'm sorry. That's right, go I, ahead, I, right. Okay, uh, I hold you in great regard uh, on that point. And uh, I know that you know what it looks like, but when you're teaching, uh, when you're having children write, uh, it isn't just scribble any old thing down. Uh, you're in the process of having them write. Uh, they're learning and using the sounds. It is a gradual release. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you could speak to that for a moment. So I um, actually reposted from someone. They had posted a picture of a little boy um, in a reading recovery lesson on Facebook, and I had reposted it. When we are going to write something, and this is also the... I think probably the closest that many teachers get to under feeling that language experience who are reading recovery teachers is that writing within our lessons where we have an authentic conversation with, with the child and we are talking about something that they are really interested in. So we go, oral language, we go from speech to print. We've got oral language, which we are formulating into an idea um, and then we write it down and it's co-writing such as interactive writing is and language experience can be too if children <laughs> often language experiences even before they can write very much <clears throat> excuse me so uh, I just have to have a sip of my tea I'm really sorry okay, about that sounds talking. like a great idea so <clears throat> We go, so we help the children write their stories down. It's co-writing. I write whatever's outside that zone of proximal development for that child right at that moment. But I'm always looking to move that cutting edge so the child takes on, and this is the gradual release you're talking about, the modeling demonstration, the sharing over into the independent. So I'm always watching as quickly as I can for me to back down and let the child take on as much as they can do. Um, you have, when you have to organize it on the page, you can help children initially because there's a big page and they don't know where to start necessarily. So you have to you have to pick what you're going to, you can't focus on everything all at once. You're going to get the message and you're going to get the message down. So <clears throat> I'm, for instance, I don't make a big fuss about starting with a capital at the very beginning. I might Say, tell them you need a capital because they're trying to write the and they're, they're just managing to get the down on the page. Help them with the space, say the words slowly. In reading recovery and many other uh, uh, reading programs and classrooms now, Elkonan boxes are used to help children scaffold again that gradual release. <clears throat> and we start off with dominant consonants, moving to easy to hear vowels and the, and the more difficult to hear vowels and then we very quickly move into orthography so we start with the phonological phonemic awareness and then we quickly move into those how words are, don't match exactly um, we're also learning high frequency words we are uh, learning how to form letters that's huge we have so many children who've got bimodal thumbs they're coming to school 
don't know how to hold a pencil, we're really having to start. And this is in classrooms, this is in kindergarten. I'm in kindergarten, K through five classrooms all the time. So <clears throat> we are getting the story down, we're increasing the complexity of the structures. Uh, just here's a quick story about my grandson. <clears throat> Very unwilling at the beginning, I've told you that. So I would show him like a little video I found on Facebook because he loves animals about a bear that got a bucket stuck on his head. And the video is showing the man, the property he was on, trying to catch him so they can get the bucket off. And the bear's not, they're chasing him. And finally, three men get him and they hold him down. And he's not a cub, it's an adolescent bear. And he's got the bucket on his head. Terrible time. They had to get the tin cutters out of the truck, cut it off. And the bear is, runs off. And I said to my grandson, oh, my goodness, that poor bear. Did you see how thankful he was to those men? He didn't fight while they were trying to take it off. He knew they were going to help them. And my grandson has the softest heart, and especially for animals. And he said, so the men saved the bear by cutting off the bucket. So I think this is a pretty good story. So off we go. The men save the bear. We get bear down, the B and the R. I help because it's a hard one. He says, Mickey, I'm Grandma Mickey. I need an S. I said, no, darling, there was only one bear. We don't need an S. I need an S. I said, well, what are you going to say? The bear, men save the bear's life. Indeed, you do need an S and you need an apostrophe. Now, I'm saying this story because often kids who struggle do not have a good grasp of English structure. This boy does. I, I find this fascinating that every child has different strengths and we have to observe carefully and teach to those strengths. We can't be saying, you have to do this because this is what's mandated or what the law says if it doesn't work for that child. So I may have strayed. I told you I bird walk. <laughs> okay. Actually, not only haven't you strayed, but you've hit probably the single most important point, And that is we have to fit the instruction to the child. And uh, different children need different forms of phonics at different times, different paces. Uh, and, and my my final thought around language experience is that not only is it powerful because the kids want to you read it, but it's also powerful because they can read and reread and reread it. I often like to tell the story of the 16-year-old that I uh, taught through language experience. And uh, it just so happens he was after his driver's license. <laughs> so we were writing many a thing uh, about and from uh, the driving manual. And he was into that uh, big time and, oh, you know, uh, highly motivated. So bringing the joy back into reading. Now, boy, bringing the joy back into reading. My gosh, I think we've, uh, uh, by following the child, uh, I think that's kind of where we're at. So uh, that all said... Uh, anything more you want to say? Um, you kind of just piggybacking on one thing you just said there was about how your we can read and reread um, language experience. Your young man was really keen to read it because it was about something that was important to him. And I think that uh, the reading mileage is really, really important. Um, Freddie Hebert just posted an article the other day and uh, amongst many other people but uh, co commenting um, on that, and, and I watched Wiley Blevins the other day, and he said, and, uh, and, and these <clears throat> people are all saying, children need to be reading lots of texts, continuous texts, while they're learning all about how print works. Because it doesn't work in isolation. You can learn it in isolation, but you see, that's, that gradual transfer of responsibility you're talking about. And I've, I've used that all my life as well. It's like, I'm not, I know it. <clears throat> I'm teaching it to you so that you can know it and you can use it. That's what it's for. It's not, to end, it's, it's already in my head. I need to help you get it into your head so that you can use it. So I think lots and lots of familiar reading, rereading, high interest um 
one book I did I told you that my grandson and this is a shout out John Cena I don't know you but you have the elbow grease character and both of my grandsons who live close to me love monster trucks they can tell you about grave digger they can everything okay and so we had read your picture book elbow grease and my husband gets a, a, a diatribe every night about how worried I am about my grandson. And he said to me the, a few weeks ago, you know, I don't think you've found the books that he really wants to read. So I so OK. So I look up John Cena on my Amazon and he does. He, he's written instructional materials about mid, about where we are, about mid grade one level, elbow grease and his family and, and, and everything that's Max, these look like he's in grade two now. He doesn't want to look like he's reading baby books. He wants to read books that look like big boy books. And these look like big boy books. And he's very excited. Fly guy in the monster truck. So we have to be creative. And I think about children in classrooms where I have to tell you, the selection of many classrooms currently is non-existent um, and not books you've got picture books you've got library books but instructional materials is not where I would like to see it be and so it's really important we have books that they want to read because the rereading is really really important Sam you're absolutely right okay well that all said uh, I'll put in one last plug uh, and this is uh, way, way back in the day, Katie Way Ray Wood uh, did some teaching for me of me, and uh, you know uh, she was all about uh, making stuff, uh, lots of writing. So making stuff, and then you use that stuff, and so lots of writing and lots of reading, but not just willy nilly. Okay, and I'm not hearing you say willy nilly. Uh, I, I'm hearing you say very explicit instruction uh, done at timely moments and uh, drawing them out. So uh, what a, a perfect way to end this. So that, uh, in, unless you have any last minute well, thought here. I, well, uh, you know me, that's a dangerous statement because we, we could talk all afternoon, but no, I'm, I'm fine. Thank you. Okay. Uh, um, and you were spectacular, by the way. So thank you. And now there's one last tradition in a Bomberito interview. And it's a silly one, but I insist on it. And that is, in just a moment, we're going to give our audience the biggest smiles we can and give them a Zoom wave goodbye. So goodbye, all. And thank you so much. <laughs>